Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to another Lost Years of Merlin stream. This is chapter three of book three of The Fires of Merlin. In the last chapter, chapter two, and Merlin was preparing to play his new magical instrument, his psaltery, and Carepri told him that he actually finished creating his instrument much faster than a typical uh, apprentice wizard, even much faster than his um, famous grandfather Tuatha. And he was really nervous to play it because a magician only gets, or a wizard only gets one chance to make a magical instrument, and if it doesn't work, that's it. So at the last part of the chapter, he plucked the strings. So now it is chapter three called The Darkest Day. Chapter 3, The Darkest Day. At the instant my thinkers plucked the cord, I felt a sudden blast of heat, strong enough to scorch my hand. I shouted, jerking back my arm, even as the sultry strings burst apart with a shattering twang. The instrument flew out of my grasp, erupting into flames. All of us watched, dumbfounded, as the sultry hung suspended in the air above us, fire licking its rim and soundboard. The oaken bridge, like the strings themselves, writhed and twisted as if in agony. At the same time, the shapes swirling around the rowan vanished in a flash, except for the multitude of leaves which rained down on our heads. Then, in the very center of the flaming psaltery, a shadowy image started to form. With the others, I gasped, for soon the image hardened into a haggard, scowling face. It was a face of wrath, a face of vengeance. It was a face that I knew well. There were the thick jowls, the unruly hair, and the piercing eyes I could not forget, the bulbous nose, and the earrings made of dangling shells. Arnalda. The name itself seemed to crackle with fire as I spoke it aloud. Who? asked my mother, gaping at the flaming visage. Tell us, insisted Carefree. Who is it? My voice is dry as the fallen leaves at our feet. I repeated the name. Arnalda, enchantress and ruler of the dwarves. I fingered the gnarled top of my staff, remembering how she had helped me once long ago. I remembered the pain of it, and how she had extracted me from a promise, a promise that I suspected would cause me greater pain by far. She is an ally, maybe even a friend, but one to be feared. At that, the blazing rim of my psaltery exploded in sparks, writhing even more. Shards of wood broke loose and sailed into the air, sizzling and sputtering. One ignited a cluster of dry berries on the overhanging branch, which burst into flames before shriveling into a fist of charcoal. Another flaming shard spun toward Rhea, barely missing her leaf-draped shoulder. Arnalda, her face ringed with fire, scowled down upon us. Merlin, she rasped at last. It be time. Time? I tried to swallow, but couldn't. Time for what? Tongues of flame shot toward me. Time for you to honor your promise. Your debt to be, your debt be great to my people, greater than you know, for we helped you even though it was against our laws. She shook her head, her wide head, clinking her earrings of fan-shaped shells. Now it be our time of need. Evil strikes the land of Arnalda, the land of the dwarves. You must come now. Her voice lowered to a rumble, and you must come alone. My mother clasped my arm. He can't. He won't. Silence, woman. The psaltery twisted so violently that it snapped in two, releasing a fountain of sparks. Yet both halves remained in the air, hovering just above our heads. The, boys, the boy knows that I would not call on him unless it be his time. He be the only one who can save my people. I shook free of my mother's grasp. The only one? Why? Arnaldo's scowl deepened. That I will tell you when you be here at my side. But hurry, time be short, very short. The enchantress paused, weighing her words. This much, though, I will tell you. My people be attacked this very day, as never before. By who? By one long forgotten until now. More flames leaped from the rim. The burning wood crackled and sizzled, almost burying her words. The dragon Valdir sleeps no more. His fire be kindled as well as his wrath. Truly I speak, oh yes, then Kyra's darkest day be upon us. Even as I shuddered, the flame suddenly vanished. 
The charred remains of my instrument twirled in the air for another instant, then fell to the grass and leaves in twisted trails of smoke. All of us stepped backward to avoid the shower of coals. I turned to Capri. His face had hardened like a craggy cliff, yet it showed the shadowed lines of his fear. His wild brows lifted as he repeated Arnaldo's final words. Fenkaira's darkest day be upon us. My son, whispered Ellen hoarsely. You mustn't heed her demand. Stay here with us in Druma Wood, where it's safe. Capri's eyes narrowed. If Valdirk has truly awakened, then none of us is safe. Grimly, he added, and our troubles are worse than even Arnaldo knows. I stamped my foot on a glowing coal. What do you mean by that? The poem, The Dragon's Eye. Haven't I shown you my transcription? Took me more than a decade to tie together the pieces and fill in the gaps. Most of them, at least. Rags and rat holes. I plan to show you, but not so soon. Not like this. My gaze fell to the remains of my psaltery. Nothing more than broken bits of charcoal and blackened strings amidst the leaves strewn over the grass. Near one of the rowan's roots, I spied a fragment of the oaken bridge. It was still connected to part of a string, the smallest one of all. Bending low, I picked up the string. So stiff, so lifeless. Not at all like the willowy ribbon I had held only moments before. No doubt if I tried to bend it now, it would shatter in my hands. I raised my head. Carepree? Yes, my boy. Tell me about that poem. He let out a long, whistling breath. It's full of holes and ambiguities, I'm afraid, but it's all we have. I'm not even sure I can remember more than the last few lines, and you will need to know more, much more, if you are, in fact, going to confront the dragon. At the edge of my vision, I saw my mother stiffen. Go on, I insisted. Doing his best not to look at her, Carepree cleared his throat. Then, with a jab of his hand, he pointed to the distant, mist-laden hills. Far, far to the north, beyond even the realm of the dwarves, lie the most remote lands of this island, the Lost Lands. Now they are scorched and reeking of death, but once they blossomed as richly as this very wood. Fruited vines, verdant meadows, ancient trees, until Valdir, last emperor of the dragons, descended. Because the people of the Lost Lands had rashly killed his mate, and, by most accounts, their only offspring, he set upon those people with the wrath of a thousand tempests. He tortured, plundered, and destroyed, leaving no trace of anything alive. He became, for all time, wings of fire. Carepri paused, looking up into the branches of the towering rowan. Finally, Valdir carried his rage southward to the rest of Finkaira. It was then that your grandfather, Tuatha, engaged him in battle, driving him back into the wastelands. Although the Battle of Bright Flames lit up the skies for three years and a day, Tuatha finally prevailed, lulling the dragon into enchanted sleep. I peered at the fragment of the psaltery in my hand. Sleep that is now ended. Yes, which is why I spoke of the dragon's eye. That poem, you see, tells the story of their battle and describes how Tuatha relied on a magic weapon, great magic, to triumph in the end. What was it? asked Rhea. He hesitated. Tell us, she insisted. The poet soft, spoke softly, yet his words thundered in my ears. The Galator. Instinctively, my hand moved to my chest, where the jeweled pendant, possessing powers as mysterious as its strange green radiance, had rested so long ago. Rhea's eyes, I could tell, caught my movement, and I knew that she, too, was recalling the Galator, and its loss to the hag Domnu that thief of the marshlands. The poem, continued Capri, ends with a prophecy. Grimly, he studied my face. A prophecy whose meaning is far from clear. He seated himself on a bulging root, his gaze focused on something far distant. After a long moment, he began to recite. When Valdir's eyes open, too many shall close. The darkest of days brings the deepest of woes. Together with terror that swells into pain, disaster shall follow his waking again. By anger unending and power unmatched, the dragon avenges his dreams yet unhatched. For when he awakens to find those dreams lost, revenge shall he covet regardless of the cost. Lo, nothing can stop him except for one foe, descended from enemies fought long ago. In terrible battle they fight to the last, 
reliving the fervor and rage of the past. Yet neither opponent shall truly prevail. The enemy's efforts and all, all finally fail. Though striving to vanquish, they perish instead. The dragon's eye closes, his enemy dead. Then air becomes water and water is fire. Both enemies fall to a power still higher. Thus only when elements suddenly merge shall end the dragon, shall end the scourge. But for the rustling of rowan leaves, there was no sound on the knoll. No one spoke, no one stirred. We stood as still as the charred scraps of my musical instrument, and as silent. Finally, Rhea stepped toward me and wrapped her forefinger around my own. Merlin, she whispered, I don't understand what all that means, but I don't like its sound, its feeling. Are you sure you want to go? Maybe Arnaldo will find some other way to stop the dra dragon without you. I scowled, pulling my hand free. Of course I don't want to go, but she did help me once when I truly needed it, and I did promise to help her in return. Not to fight a dragon, exclaimed my mother, her voice frantic. I faced the woman who had, only moments before, been jubilant enough to sing. You heard, Arnalda. She said I'm the only one who can save her people. Why, I'm not sure, but it must have something to do with the prophecy. No one can defeat the dragon except for one person. The one descended from enemies fought long ago. That means me, don't you see? Why, she implored. Why must it be you? Because I am the one descended from Tuatha, the only wizard out of all of those who must have battled him down through the ages, who finally bested him, who defeated him at least for a time. I tapped the top of my staff, and I am the only one, it seems, who might have a chance to do the rest. Her sapphire eyes dimmed as she turned to Kirpri. Why didn't Tuatha kill the dragon when he had the chance? Slowly, the poet ran both his hands through his hair. I don't know just as I don't know what the prophecy meant by the dragon's lost dreams, or by air becoming water and water merging with fire. With an effort, he tore his gaze from Ellen and turned to me. Yet some of it seems plain, too plain. It does, I fear, point to you as Valdir's foe, and as the only one who can stop him from reducing most of Thinkyra to ashes. For once he begins, he won't be satisfied just to wipe out the dwarf's realm or even this forest, he will thirst to destroy everything he can. And so, Merlin, it may well be your part to confront the dragon, just as your grandfather did in the Battle of Bright Flames. But this time, the outcome will be different. This time, both of you will die. He swallowed. Every bard I know understands the importance of this poem. That is why I spent so many years transcribing it, trying to piece it all together. While much remains debatable, no one, no one at all, disagrees on the outcome of the battle. The dragon's eye closes, his enemy dead. Whoever vanquishes the dragon will die as well. Even as she tucked a loose vine behind her, back into her sleeve, Rhea examined him closely. But there's more, isn't there? Something important that the other bards don't agree with you about? His cheeks flushed. You have your mother's way of seeing right through my skin. He indicated the sphere glowing softly with orange light hanging from her woven belt. Perhaps that is why Merlin gave you the orb of fire. Thoughtfully, Rhea stroked the orb. The truth is, I'm still not sure why he gave it to me. She glanced at me, even though I'm grateful. But that doesn't matter now. Tell us the rest. The wind strengthened, rattling the branches above us as a warrior rattles sword and shield. The leaves rustled at our feet, while more leaves, twigs, and flakes of bark twir twirled downward. I felt a touch of winter chill in the air, even as my fingers still smarted from the heat of my burning saltry. Carepy brushed a twig off his ear. I'm not sure about all this, but I think the key to the prophecy may be that obscure reference near the end. A power still higher. Whatever it means, it must be something stronger than the dragon, and stronger than me, someone whose magical instrument never played a single note. I know, my boy. He studied me anxiously. Yet, even so, this power may be something you could still master, and if you could, perhaps, you could use it somehow to overcome the dragon. What is it? I demanded. What could be more powerful than a dragon? Rags and rat holes, boy, I wish I knew. Rhea slapped her thigh. Maybe it's the Galator. After all, we know it helped before. 
I waved the idea away. Even if you're right, there's no time now to try to get it back. It's all the way under the other side of the island, and Arnalda needs help right now. It's going to take several days, as it is, just to reach her borders. If only my leaping were strong enough to send me there right away. But it's not. I rolled the blackened string between my fingers. And probably never will be now. Somberly, I shook my head. No, let's hope that this higher power means something else besides the Galator, and that I can somehow find it. Her voice weak, my mother protested once more. But you don't even have a plan. Nothing unusual for him, observed Rhea. He'll try to make one up as he goes along. Then I shall make a plan of my own, Ellen replied grimly. To pray, and to not, and try not to grieve before I must. Carepree heaved a sigh. Are you sure you want to do this, Merlin? No one would blame me if you chose to stay right here with us. My gaze fell to the brittle string and shard of wood in my hand, all that remained of my salt tree, my failed attempt at higher magic. How could I, with only my staff and sword to help me, even hope to challenge a powerful foe, let alone Valdirig himself? I lifted the lid off my satchel of healing herbs and precious objects, started to slip the charred remains inside, then caught myself. Why should I keep such a thing? It was useless to me or anyone else. I let it fall from my grasp onto the ground. At the same time, my fingertip, already inside the satchel, brushed against something soft. A feather. I smiled sadly, remembering the feisty young hawk who had given me so much, including my own name. Who had never shied away from a battle, even the one that finished his life? At last, I lifted my head. I must go. Okay, so that was the end of chapter three. So please join me tomorrow for chapter four. It is called A Distant Chime. Thank you for joining me. Have a wonderful night.